Ваше Величество, позвольте мне распорядиться. Пусть я буду виновен в этой крови. Вся кровь будет вечно на мне. It is perhaps to nobody's surprise that Nicholas was a military man through and through. If you look at autocrats throughout history, they tend to appreciate the army. Nicholas himself summed it up more or less neatly. Here there is order, there is a strict, unconditional legality, no impertinent claims to know all the answers, no contradiction, all things flow logically one from the other. No one commands before he has himself learned to obey. No one steps in front of anybody else without lawful reason. Everything is subordinated to one definite goal. Everything has its purpose. Besides this, it is the tangible instrument and manifestation of a supreme commander's power. And what power it is to command an army one million strong. In Nicholas's pious worldview, it was a perfect microcosm of the divine system. God as supreme commander, Nicholas as his first lieutenant, followed by a clear hierarchy of generals, admirals, officers, privates and soldiers. The emperor had always been fascinated by the army, hardly atypical of a noble boy in 19th century Europe. In his early years, he and his brother Michael would spend any free moment playing with their toy soldiers. When middle school began, Nicholas became enraptured with military science and devoted himself fully to it, largely to the neglect of all other subjects. His mother frequently tried to nudge him towards other disciplines, but he was far too stubborn. One of his tutors once gave him an assignment, quote, to prove that military science is not the only service for a nobleman, but that other occupations are for him just as honorable and noble. Nicholas was stumped and refused refused to write anything, his teacher had to dictate the essay for him. As he grew older, and the likelihood that he might one day rule over Russia increased, he committed himself more seriously to other disciplines which he had learned to appreciate, but as he put it, quote, military matters alone occupied me passionately. Only in them did I find consolation. Nicholas was just 16 when Napoleon launched his invasion of Russia. He'd even won a bet with his sister that the Grande Armée would be ousted before January of 1813. To his and his brother's frustration, though, they were prevented from fighting. It was only in 1814 when Alexander gave Nicholas his permission to join the army. By the time he arrived in Western Europe, though, Napoleon had been captured in Paris. So, after some sightseeing in the French capital, he returned to Russia to resume his studies, visiting the courts of Western and Central Europe along the way, and meeting his future wife. When he arrived back in Russia, Napoleon had returned from Elba and was making his last stand against the Seventh Coalition. So Nicholas went back westward, but by the time he got there again, the Battle of Waterloo had already occurred and Napoleon was defeated for good. Despite this farcical series of events, Nicholas was spared the horrors of war. It was only in 1828, during the Russo-Turkish War, when he saw men being ripped apart by cannon or suffering from starvation or dysentery. He would never lead in battle again. Hence, Nicholas wasn't as hawkish as his brothers were, and felt contempt for those who glorified war. To him, it was something to be avoided at all costs, a necessary evil only to be waged as a means of defense. His critics might scoff at this, viewing Russian expansionism as nothing short of barefaced aggression. But as we've seen, Nicholas was deeply pious and was convinced in the need to protect Russia from revolution. Hence, he was committed to the defense of a divinely ordained system of government, and to the defense of fellow Christians living under Ottoman tyranny. Considering Nicholas's simplistic views of the world, one can point to a certain naiveness in his character, but might find it difficult leveling serious charges of dishonesty or opportunism. Indeed, as even one of his most fierce critics put it, quote, I do not believe that there is today on any throne a prince who detests falsehood so much and who lies so little as this one. Queen Victoria took it one step further, saying, quote, I do not believe he is very bright, no doubt sensitive to his 
inflexible principles and ethical absolutism. This notion of defense is a running theme throughout his life. One observer from his childhood remembers that whenever he built toy fortresses for his nurses, he never forgot to fortify them with cannon. Later, in early adulthood, he specialized as a military engineer, eventually becoming head of the army's engineers under Alexander I, overseeing the building of Russia's fortifications after Napoleon's ravages. And of course, when he became head of the armed forces upon his succession, he worked to build an impregnable fortress state from the tides of anarchy. But once again, it was above all the orderly aspect of the army that he truly prized. As already stated, he was a drill master at heart, and nothing pleased him more than the thousands of hours he spent across his 30-year rule, carrying out inspections, overseeing small unit drills, and all the other minutiae of military life. He himself admitted it was, quote, his one true delight, and he felt closer than ever to God when faced with the awe-inspiring sight of rank and file moving in unison in their glittering colored uniform. He always impressed Russian and Austrian officers with his detailed knowledge of their field manuals. Perhaps the best indication of his pedantic love of military aesthetic was the reform of military uniforms he passed near the start of his rule, the design for which he counted each and every single button. It was this regimentation that he so craved in his own government. It's no wonder the vast majority of his ministers had military experience. You can imagine the levels of cronyism, with everybody in his inner circle speaking in military jargon and working with a military ethos. And this ethos would seep into all aspects of Nicholas's life. As one of his aides put it, quote, the emperor of Russia is a military commander and each one of his days is a day of battle. For one, he carried himself like a general always dressed in uniform, always moving with vigor and speed and purpose, barking orders at his subordinates. He had little regard for his own health and safety, always insisting on his titanic odysseys through Russia, despite the risks they posed in the age of pre-modern medicine. His attitude towards his own life is perhaps best summarized by his own words, quote, God is my protector, and if I am no longer needed for Russia, then he will take me to his bosom. Even when he was told of imminent assassination risks, official travels were never postponed. And never was he more the fearless, if reckless, commander-in-chief than during moments of crisis. In 1831, a cholera outbreak in St. Petersburg led to a popular revolt. A hospital was stormed and several of its doctors were murdered by an angry mob. Nicholas personally travelled by carriage to Haymarket Square, one of St. Petersburg's main plazas. When he emerged from his carriage and addressed the crowds, he brought 5,000 people to their knees and the revolt ended. This docile obedience to his power was exactly what he thought was best for Russia. Under his watch, Russia became much more militarized. New segments of the Russian population, including students, were made to wear uniforms. The jurisdiction of military courts was expanded, military schools multiplied, and whole administrative departments, from forestry to mining, were given a military unit. As for his private life, his relationship with his wife and children, the military ethos reigned supreme. He was the man of the house, though passionate and tender and chivalrous with his cherished wife, obedience was expected. Likewise for his seven children. In his view, he was rearing the future of the empire. Though he loved them dearly and certainly took pains to ensure their education was nowhere near as painful as his own, he treated them with the same sternness as a commander would his soldiers. He demanded, for example, daily reports of their activities and lessons from the previous day. As for Nicholas's living quarters, they had the simplicity and orderliness of barracks. Nicholas was in fact extremely minimalist with his furnishings, with nothing more than the very basics for sleep, work, and leisure. Historians have noted Nicholas's almost split personality on this front. Public buildings built under his supervision were bold, ostentatious and complex. His own private tastes, however, were the complete contrary, perhaps influenced by the Christian emphasis on humility as well. These public buildings, just like his artistic tastes, were, as a historian put it, quote, permeated with militarism at its best incarnation. He loved uniformity, straight lines, a severe symmetry, the regularity of design. Not only did they satisfy his own aesthetics, but they telegraphed to the people of Russia and foreign visitors the power of the state. It's quite a neat encapsulation, given Nicholas's own preference for modesty and simplicity, of his propensity for facade. So what do I mean by facades? I mean his obsession with the trivial aesthetics of his drill units, his 
self-delusion during his tours of Russia that his rushed inspections made for fruitful government, or the neat piles of documents on his desk which he reviewed and stamped without wanting to hear any more fuss. This was the Nikolaevan system, facades and superficiality. A typical example is the Russian army, widely feared across Europe for its size and its ferocious reputation. However, the Crimean War exposed its technological backwardness and the incompetence of its generals. Like army, like state, like ruler then. For Emperor Nicholas was a walking facade of spellbinding majesty and vigor. Beneath it all though, was a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. Queen Victoria, during Nicholas's state visit in 1844, said this of Nicholas. He is certainly a very striking man, still very handsome, his profile is beautiful, and his manners most dignified and graceful. Extremely civil, quite alarmingly so, as he is full of attentions and politeness. But the expression of his eyes is formidable, and unlike anything I ever saw before. He seldom smiles, and when he does, the expression is not a happy one. This was hardly an uncommon observation by his contemporaries. French travel writer, the Marquis de Custine, wrote, he cannot smile at the same time with his eyes in his mouth a disharmony which denotes a perpetual constraint. The matter was all the more obvious, given the man's aura. Going by the dozens of testimonies by observers, awestruck by his beauty and command, the man quite simply had an overwhelming presence, easily one to dominate an entire room. Whenever I saw him, said an American diplomat, there was forced to my lips the thought, you are the most majestic being ever created. Some spoke of his, quote, terrestrial divinity, others of his likeness to biblical and mythological colossi like Moses and Jupiter. One Polish diplomat remembered how he was stunned by the quote, ruler of the world in appearance and that he simply could not look into his eyes. But many did, and what they believed to see was a man in pain. The discrepancy between his forceful aura and his quote, Muscovite melancholy, as one observer put it, was particularly obvious while he was abroad on state visits. Nicholas was a firm believer that his own charisma and charms were the best tools for diplomacy. Nicholas's brother, it's noted, was just the same, while abroad, the perfect gentleman despite his notoriously foul temperament. When he returned home to Russia, however, it's said he would look at himself in the mirror and while putting on his grey Russian uniform, say, quote, goodbye, Michael, Pavlovich. This idea of a bulletproof shell of strength and civility likely took an ever more extreme form for Nicholas as he was emperor. His commitment to autocracy as the only form of government and his strong sense of duty meant he had no choice but to put up a strong front. And it seems that this was instinctive for him. As one observer wrote, the habit of repressing these feelings has become so inseparable from his very being that you see in him no awkwardness, no embarrassment, nothing studied. And yet all his words, as all his movements, follow a cadence as if he had a sheet of music in front of him. There is nothing in the tone of his voice or in the construction of his sentences that indicates pride or dissimulation. And yet you feel that his heart is closed, that the barrier is impassable, and that one would be mad to hope to penetrate the privacy of his thoughts. This tension between the emperor and the man also emerges in political matters, where the need for a firm hand always won over Nicholas's human inclination. For example, Nicholas, unlike Michael or Constantine, found the state of serfdom in Russia to be completely reprehensible. In March 1842, he made perhaps the strongest ever indictment against the institution ever made by a Russian ruler when he addressed his state council and said, there is no doubt, but that serfdom in its present form is an evil for all concerned. He would try to find ways to improve the lot of the peasantry throughout his rule, but he was hamstrung by the prospect of provoking the landowning nobility and materializing his deep-seated fears of revolution from within. On the fates of the Decemberist mutineers, he said, it is possible that his mother will come here to witness the disgrace of her unworthy son. What a terrible thought, all the more so because I can do nothing to soften his punishment. On this theme, the Marquis de Custine perceptively wrote, quote, If the emperor has no more mercy in his heart than he reveals in his policies, then I pity Russia. If, on the other hand, his true sentiments are really superior to his acts, then I pity the emperor. To Nicholas, this outward facade was part of the job part of the sacred mission. He expected those in his service to put aside their human frailties for the good of the country. If anybody couldn't be happy in the pursuit of one's duties, 
than their happiness needed to be sacrificed, probably just as his own was. After the Polish uprising of 1830 was quashed and Poland was annexed, Nicholas insisted, quote, they must be made happy in spite of themselves. To him, as his Christian faith dictated, human suffering was inevitable. It could only be redeemed through duty. This is the explanation for Nicholas's constant stiffness, which was repulsive to many and made him unpopular even before he was emperor. It's an unfortunate public perception as it contrasts sharply with a much more tender Nicholas in private. You only have to read some of Nicholas's letters to his wife, whom he perhaps loved more than any other person. Quote, God has bestowed upon such a happy character that it is no merit to love you. Their genuine love and complete trust in one another was rare, especially since their marriage was arranged. When the Winter Palace went up in flames in 1837, Nicholas is said to have ordered an aide-de-camp, quote, let everything else burn up. Only just save for me the small case of letters in my study, which my wife wrote to me when she was my betrothed. Charlotte, or Alexandra, as she was christened after marriage, recognized her husband's cold facade. Reminiscing their early romance said, quote, it is true that my Nicholas was far too serious for his 21 years, especially when he appeared publicly at balls. Recalling her wedding day, she said, quote, I felt myself very, very happy when our hands joined. With complete confidence and trust, I gave my life into the hands of my Nicholas, and he never once betrayed my trust. Alexandra was the strongest emotional crutch in Nicholas's life. He didn't have many friends. Once he expressed his surprise at an aid for having so many. I've lived longer than you and have not found three to whom I can speak freely from my soul. And these rare friendships, which he valued enormously, extended to men who either predeceased him or lived abroad for extended periods. The loving and soft-tempered Alexandra was Nicholas's first and foremost confidant, and he was emotionally reliant on her. As he wrote himself, If I was now and then demanding, this happened because I look for everything in you. If I do not find it, I am distressed. I say to myself, no, she does not understand me, and these are unique, rare, but difficult moments. Perhaps one of the more dramatic of these moments was in the summer of 1845, when Alexandra, who had a medical history of sickliness and frailty, fell ill. Her doctor recommended that she travel abroad to the warmer climes of Sicily and recover there for a while. Nicholas's reaction to the news of her prescription totally characteristic, is vividly recorded by the physician himself. He remained for a moment standing in front of me. His big, powerful eyes rested sadly on me, and it was as if an electric discharge had gone through all my limbs. A tear collected slowly there and threatened to roll over the brim. Then he gripped hard with his entire right arm, my left forearm, squeezed it strongly and said, leave me my wife here. As for Nicholas's behaviour toward Alexandra, she later noted in her diary, he appeared to be beside himself, that is, in his own way and like no other man could be, not storming or angry or crying, but icily cold, and that toward me. He did not address to me two sentences in the course of an entire week. Though it devastated him, eventually he yielded, recognising it was for the best. But the incident is a potent example of his strong emotional dependence on his wife and potentially a fear of abandonment. And his subsequent strong emotions were of course forcibly suppressed, as Alexandra put it, quote, in his own way and like no other man could. And let's not forget Nicholas's childhood. There's no knowing the true emotional toll of his father's assassination when he was not even five. His main father figure growing up was his Prussian mentor, Count Lambsdorff, a man described as quite perfidious, egotistical, haughty and narrow, who frequently beat the young boy even during class. Even as an adult, Nicholas still shuddered at the man's name. Nicholas's mother, meanwhile, was a virtuous and noble woman by all accounts, but was said to be extremely rigid and cold, while being highly exacting of her children. In childhood, the mini-tyrant had few friends, spending most of his time with his younger siblings, over whom he was extremely protective. Returning to Alexandra, he might not have realized the damaging effects the pressures of his own office had on her. Her deteriorating health made heart attacks more likely, intercourse was prohibited by the doctor, not least to avoid an eighth pregnancy that could be fatal. Nicholas would eventually take a mistress, one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting named Varvara Nelidov. The decision to do so was a long, drawn-out dilemma for him of battling his own religious and aristocratic codes of ethics. However, it was widely accepted in court, even encouraged by some, who were even surprised at how he, quote, 
clung on to this strange notion of marital fidelity. Nicholas would ultimately fall under the weight of his own impossible system. The Crimean War was the straw on the camel's back. His strong health and constitution was shattered by a common cold, which paralyzed his lungs, but his sense of duty stayed with him until the bitter end. In his final hours, he was lucid, composed, and dignified. To his soldiers, he ordered, tell them that in the other world, I shall continue to pray for them. I have always tried to work for their good. If I failed in that, this was not because of a lack of goodwill, but because of a lack of knowledge and ability, I beg them to pardon me. To his beloved eldest son, Alexander, he said, I wanted to take everything difficult, everything heavy upon myself and to leave you a peaceful, orderly and happy realm. Providence determined otherwise. Now I shall ascend to pray for Russia and for you. After Russia, I loved you above everything else in the world. Serve Russia. In the final agony of his life, he held on tightly to the hands of Alexandra and his son, locking his eyes on them until his final breath. What's incredible about Nicholas's rule is the extent to which the state was completely intertwined with his character. Authoritarian, paranoid, reactionary, but in the name of strong moral and religious principles. It was magnificently vigorous on the outside, yet cowardly and insecure on the inside. It was strong-willed and craving order, but ultimately despotic. As one observer noted, Nicholas could in every sense permit himself to say, as did his French ideological forebear, the state is I. For all of Nicholas's genuine efforts to promote his conception of what was good and what was right, his efforts could only hold out for so long. A former serf who worked as a censor in Nicholas's Russia concluded, the main shortcoming of the reign of Nicholas was that it was all a mistake. Though it was war, not revolution, which would end the Nikolaevan system, the mass appeal of change made reform unavoidable if the Tsarist regime wished to endure. Nicholas had hoped he could use the rise of Russian nationalism to his advantage. The 1812 defense of Russia against Napoleon's invasion left many Russian intellectuals brimming with hope for the future of Russia's national identity. Finally, a rallying cause for Russianness, where the country united against a foreign enemy. Many of these voices called for sweeping liberal reforms, including the abolition of serfdom as a way of rewarding the masses for their popular sacrifice. But the Decembrist revolt convinced Nicholas that Russia was not ready for this type of reform. Riding on the wave of this nationalism though, he attempted to encourage many of the notions of Russianness the intelligentsia had pushed for. However, he manipulated Russianness to suit his own political convictions. Official nationality was its concrete manifestation. A police state and a repressive army were its defenders. And it brings to mind another figure in our time. The dissolution of the Soviet Union, like the Napoleonic Wars, was also a period where Russian identity came under the spotlight. In its aftermath, a certain former spymaster rose to power to unite Russia under an iron fist reviving a collapsed economy. He also brought his own spin on Russianness, once again by opposition to foreign threats, once again aligned with his political worldview. While Nicholas was by all accounts a far nobler figure than the KGB weasel sitting alone in the Kremlin, their reigns bear many parallels, too many for this video. Suffice to say, just like the Crimean War, the war in Ukraine has exposed the true face and unsustainability of Putin's system. It's shown the inadequacies of the Russian army and it's already having devastating consequences on average Russians. With each passing day of the war, his regime moves one step closer towards a precipice. Just as with Nicholas, it seems unlikely a popular movement will topple him, the repressive apparatus of his regime will not allow for it. But financial disaster is practically a certainty. Western sanctions aim to cripple the regime and likely will not be lifted even with an end to the conflict. Many Russians support Putin for his promises of economic strength, but with the looming crisis ahead, who knows whether this could change? Will we see the end of Putin? If so, will he simply be replaced by another dictator? Or will the historic cycle be broken? Will the Russian people finally end their course in their centuries-old pursuit of freedom from state oppression? At the very least, let's hope that they can unite. <laughs>